good afternoon and welcome to the second annual web-based academic vision for excellence seminars also known as waves which is hosted by the wyoming department of education the special education programs division we are really appreciative of your time and effort to learn from local and national presenters on important topics that impact educators students and families across our state i am dina smith with the wyoming department of education and i'll be your host today we really do encourage you to participate and ask questions throughout the session by posting your questions in the chat box and your questions will be answered throughout the presentation today. Presentation recordings and materials will be available for you at the Wyoming Instructional Network for the remainder of the school year. So watch for that link to be provided in the chat box during this session. Also, please note that there's been a change in obtaining PTSB and STARS credit. There will be a WAVE summer fall PTSB form emailed to all registered participants, which will list all sessions that have occurred from August through November. Participants will be responsible to track your own hours of attendance for the WAVES conference for the summer fall semester. And then you'll just submit one form that will um, check off the box of all the sessions that you've attended for that time. Um, the submission deadline is, is December 15th, and no forms will be accepted after that time on December 15th. PTSB credit will be submitted by WDE once attendance has been verified, and there will be a separate PTSB form for the winter spring sessions, which will begin in January and end in May 2022. If you're seeking STARS credit, please contact Jennifer Duncan at yo.gov. At the end of the session, please fill out an evaluation for this session because your feedback is really valuable and it actually does help to drive the planning of our future webinars or events. The link will also be posted in the chat box a little later in this session. All of this information will also be posted in a follow-up email that you should re receive within 24 hours of this session. Um, if you are on an iPad or anything, please take a moment to rename yourself by going down to the participants and then clicking on more and rename. Um, that way we can show your attendance here today. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Lenore Knutson, who is our presenter today. Lenore Knutson's career has been shaped by diverse professional opportunities. After earning a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in education, Ms. Knutson became a nationally certified school psychologist working with school teams, parents, and children. School psychology ignited a passion for special education and improving the lives of children and young adults with disabilities. Ms. Knutson later attended law school where she earned a Juris Doctor degree with honors from William Mitchell College of Law. She now continues school psychology and special education law, dispute resolution, the work of special education teams, and building professional capacity in special education disciplines. Currently, Ms. Knudsen's career has culminated in a rich blend of issues focusing on education and dispute resolution. She is certified as a, medi a mediator and also serves as a special education mediator, or mediator, complaint investigator, and hearing officer in several states. Ms. Knudsen provides professional development in education and dispute resolution and speaks to audiences across the nation. In 2012, Ms. Knutson joined with Stephanie Weaver to create Pingora Consulting LLC, offering an array of services focusing on education, dispute resolution, systems building, and legal compliance. And we are very fortunate to have her working with Wyoming. And it is now my honor to turn the time over to Lenore Knutson. Thank you, Dina. I appreciate that. I always um, enjoy working in Wyoming. I feel a little bit of a kindred spirit. Uh, first of all, my oldest, as many of you know, or excuse me, my youngest, as many of you know, is a senior at the University of Wyoming. And so I do get to uh, get up there quite a bit, both for work and for personal reasons. Um, I wanna thank you for inviting me back. We had one of these sessions on refining implementation of IDEA uh, a few weeks ago and had great participation. This one we have tailored to speech language pathologists 
there'll be something in it for everyone, uh, but we will be primarily targeting speech language pathologists today with this presentation. And then we have one more coming up that is for, I believe, uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and behavior intervention specialists. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Um, I have to shorten that bio a little bit. That seemed far longer than I remember. I apologize for making you wait. And I also have to point out that I too am in a sweater today, although I live in Arizona. We have an unexpected cold front and it dipped down into the 60s. So I am ready to pull out my winter gear um, with this kind of temperature. Uh, let's see, we've got about 55 people on the line. Um, it's a good sized group. However, it's not so big that we can't share our thoughts and questions. So I'm going to invite all of you in real time to either use the chat box or raise your virtual hand or unmute yourself and just shout out questions or comments to the presentation. It is much, much better and far more rich if we all discuss this together rather than just listening to me present. So I truly welcome your comments and questions throughout today's topic. Uh, I believe um, that we will go and, to, and I'll need a little help here monitoring time, of course, Dina, and then uh, especially to make sure that we leave enough time at the end uh, if people have additional questions. So here we go. Um, we're gonna spend the next hour and a half or so talking about refining implementation of IDEA. Uh, I'm not gonna spend any more time on who I am since Dina did such an excellent introduction, but I do wanna challenge you today and always to be a lifelong learner. Um, it is the responsibility of every education professional to think deeply, sharpen your skill set learn new things and improve outcomes on behalf of kids with disabilities, that means that you challenge yourself. You don't come into this with the same thinking and you don't leave with the same thinking. Every day you grow a little bit and learn something and incorporate that into your practice. So my request for the, the day today is lean in. Our topics today, we're gonna start out with the concept of teamwork and how important it is under IDEA. Um, we're going to then talk about aligning services and needs. Uh, we're going to talk about providing those services consistent with the IEP. Um, we're going to talk about educational benefit, how you know it when you see it, what it looks like, uh, what are some expectations. And that will take us all the way through our time. But before we get started into that, I wanted to take just a minute and give you some context. Since this presentation is about speech language, um, I thought it was important for you to be able to know in your own state um, what kinds of numbers that we're talking about. Um, so in this is 2018-19 uh, and 2019-20 data, and we have Wyoming, and then we have the national comparator on the right-hand side. Um, so if you look at ages three to five, uh, Wyoming in 2018-19, 73.2% students with disabilities had the, uh, were identified as speech language, and 66.4%. Uh, when you look at the national average, there's quite a big uh, difference there. 2018-19 um, would be 41.4%, and then 2019-20 is 38%. This is the Section 618 data that Wyoming submits to the federal government each year and it can be found at www.ed.gov. Um, so think about that a little bit. Uh, if you continue on into the orange, we've got 2018-19, K-12, 25.5%. So let's hit pause right there. If you look at three to five, we have 73.2 for the same time frame. drops down to 25.5, K-12. Um, for the national comparator, we're at 41.4. And then for the same time period for K-12, it drops down to 6.4. For 2019-20, three to five, we're at 66.4%. And for K-12, it drops down to 27.8%. The national comparator, 38 and 16. So it seems um, somewhat reasonable or understandable that there is a drop when we go from three to five to K-12, right? I mean, a smaller percentage of students are identified with speech language disabilities. The question that I have in looking at this data is, um, 
we have higher numbers than the national average for both K-12 and also very much so for ages three to five. For the folks participating on the line, what do you think is going on there? What's different about Wyoming than the rest of the nation when it comes to identification of students as speech language impaired? Any thoughts or comments on that? By the way, you could look back over a number of years and the same pattern would exist. Um, and so I pulled just two years of data, but this same pattern exists uh, well back into history. Does this surprise anyone? Does it uh, intrigue you? Is, do you think that this is a natural part of dealing with the three to five age group as opposed to the K-12 age group? Anyone? Lenore, we do have um, a couple of things in the chat here. In fact, oh, now we're getting some more. Hold on just a second. <laughs> um, sure, someone sure. said possibly the fact that we are discouraged from using the DD label. Um, do you want me to pause as we as I read these or do you want me to read yeah, them all? So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, discouraged from using the DD label is um, it is interesting. It's an interesting way to phrase it. Um, you know, the DD label, the developmental dis delay label in the state of Wyoming is a rule out category. So it's, it's not so much that you're discouraged from using the DD label by definition and by state rule, you're unable to use it if a student qualifies in any other category, right? So if a student qualifies in speech language, um, then they would need to be identified, the student would need to be identified as speech language eligible as opposed to DD. Um, and that is by definition. Uh, so it would be an absolute prohibition in Wyoming to identify a student as developmentally delayed if that student had met eligibility criteria in a different category. Um, so, and I'm, I'm looking at the comments now too, so I'm gonna okay. just kind of go through them one at a time. Um, the tools available for assessing three to five eligibility are primarily speech language based. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and so <laughs> the acquisition of language is such a primary factor in that age that it may be um, somewhat skewing those numbers. But if, if that were true, wouldn't that also be true at the national level? Um, you know, we would expect to see the 73.2 and the 66.4 be much more on, com on point or in comparison with national levels as well. So that may be a factor, but I don't know that it could be the whole factor. Um, here's a comment, the CDC schools only qualify for speech language for everything. Um, this next person is new to Wyoming and was told that three to five years speech language is the primary eligibility. Hmm. That's also interesting. Um, I think that uh, that is in practice often how it turns out, but that would not be anything. Let me just answer or respond to that comment by saying to you that part B is part B and that eligibility categories are the same eligibility categories throughout part B. And uh, part B covers from ages three on up through exceeding the age of eligibility, which is uh, up to, I believe, 22 in your state, right? So um, if that is a factor, that would be an informal factor that might require a little more study because that would not be consistent with Part B. The next one here, I think too, that by getting involved early, we're able to help kids catch up more quickly so that they no longer need speech language services in kindergarten. Um, I do appreciate the concept of early intervention. I strongly believe in it. However, in order to cross the, the threshold into IDEA services, a child must have a disability and need specially designed instruction. And so um, if a child only needs to catch up, it begs the question if they truly have an IDEA disability. Um, so. Again, I don't wanna discount the importance, the incredible importance of early intervention, but I do wanna caution and say that that can't always be special education because of the, the definitions and the framework 
associated with the IDEA and also the funding structure, right? There are ways to cross the threshold into special education and it's having an IDEA disability and the need for specially designed instruction. So in order to help kids catch up, there's got to be other ways other than identifying them as disabled. Um, that can't be the only system to help kids catch up uh, because if a student is, is quickly catching up and they no longer need speech language services in kindergarten, it begs the question, were they appropriately identified as a child with a disability in the first place? Um, Next one, if half the tools we can use are language-based, it impacts eligibility. Agreed, truly agree with that. But that would also account for a similar kind of pattern on the, um, on the national comparator side. And look at the difference there, 73% versus 41% in 2018-19, 66 versus 38 in 2019-20. So this isn't just a, a testing tool or, or, or you know, phenomenon going on here. Um, next comment was more testing available in K-12 for diagnoses such as ASD, et cetera. Um, yeah, that, that's also an interesting comment because again, the very same Part B requirements, all of them, the whole enchilada applies in what I call little b, three to five. It's all Part B and identical. Uh, next comment, DD qualification in Wyoming asks us to rule out every other category for eligibility before qualifying. It's very true, uh, DD is a rule out category. So yeah, if they have a, a qualifying score in speech language, then that would be how they qualify for services. Couldn't agree more. Um, and, and that may account for some students, but it certainly doesn't account for the whole 73%. Uh, next comment, we also have a big group of students labeled speech language who are truly ESL, meaning that English is their second language. Yes, am I, am I understanding the context of that comment? Um, and still end up with an IDEA speech language label. Yeah, that, that's hard because it's hard to tease out the, um, you know, English as a second language students as opposed to students with a true disability. Um, and, you know, one of the ways to do that is to test students in their native language to ensure that you're trying to tease out the difference between um, language barriers and true disability. Um, next comment, articulation kiddos, how do you support the need for specially designed instruction? Um, I do believe that's a question, not necessarily a comment. And I think that that is a really good question also because IDEA eligibility, as you'll see as we move through the slides, is definitely a two part analysis. First, you have to confirm that the student has an IDEA disability. And second, and equally important, you must confirm that the student needs a specially designed instruction. Specially designed instruction is a defined term and we're gonna go through it. So um, with any disability category, whether it's speech language or any other category, both prongs have to be met. And, and I think that is a, an especially maybe big challenge for students who are articulation only. And then the next comment at our CDC the CDC is all Department of Health, not Department of Ed. Uh, that is a fact, yes. Uh, three to five is housed under the Department of Health, not the Department of Education. However, um, be clear that WDE is the SEA, the State Education Agency, and as the SEA, they must be responsible and they do hold general supervisory authority over all education programs in the state. Um, and IDEA would certainly have authority over special ed programs as well. So the SEA, WDE, is required then to exercise general supervisory authority over all local education agencies. Most often that's a school district, but sometimes it's an agency. Um, 
And, and as a result of that, they must be involved in confirming and ensuring that FAPE is available to students with disabilities. All right, did we exhaust the comments? That was a great first round. And I love the fact that you're all communicating. So thank you for that. Uh, I very much appreciate it. And I will encourage that throughout. Um, I think if you want my take on it, and I've been involved in Wyoming a very long time. I mean, uh, I, I gave you a glimpse. My youngest is a senior at the University of Wyoming. He was about five years old when I started working with Wyoming. So you get a sense of um, my perspective being really one that's decades old in the state. And uh, certainly without dating myself, I'll tell you that my special education perspective is decades old as well. When I first started into school psychology, we called the IDEA Public Law 94142. So if anyone on the line recognizes those numbers, then you know that um, I've been in the business for a long time. And my perspective on that, that table that I just showed you uh, is probably a combination of all of the things that came out in the chat. Um, I do believe that there is some unique and, and certainly this is a fact because Wyoming is the only state that has three to five in a separate agency. So there may be some of that. Uh, there may be some things associated with um, identifying students at that young age. It's very language-based. And I think that's one of the reasons you see on the national comparator side that the numbers are higher three to five nationally and uh, as compared to the numbers K-12 nationally. It's just that Wyoming has an, in, a number over and above that that would far exceed any statistical kinds of difference. There's a there's something else going on here. So I always encourage you to think about that. And I, I do know from working with districts over the years that there's been a lot of question about it. So we're ready to launch into our teamwork. This is our first uh, topic for today. And I, um, over the years, have not really sung the praises of OSEP. OSEP is the Office of Special Education Programs within the United States Department of Education. Um, I don't believe that they're quite as responsive as they should be. And uh, I think our last COVID, our COVID pandemic crisis is a great example when um, they were a little slow to put out some guidance. But, you know, all in all, it is a big uh, agency that has a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to give credit where credit is due, and this is one area where OSEP and the United States Department of Education was particularly brilliant. They put the responsibility for making decisions in a team. That framework is absolutely brilliant um, because teams share input, teams also share responsibility, and the collective wisdom that comes from making decisions at a team far exceeds the decision-making capacity of any one individual. So teams also need leaders. And I would encourage all of you to be that team leader. Um, the absolute, again, brilliant piece about IDEA is the fact that we have a team decision framework. Parents are always included in the decision-making process. They have the right to participate. This right is an absolute mandate within the scheme set out under IDEA. So if you haven't included parents in the decision-making, I will tell you statistically, the more likely they are to dispute your decision. The more you lean in and encourage parents to be part of that team decision-making, the fewer disputes you have. So if you want to reduce the amount of disagreement at your team table, if you want to reduce the uh, state complaints, due process hearing requests, any kind of disagreement in special education, the key to that is including the parents more, not less. They have an absolute right to be present in this decision-making process. If they choose not to be part of the decision-making process, the child's right to FAPE continues and the school will have obligations to meet and it will require some really comprehensive documentation, um, but know that 
a parent has the right to participate, even if they're unable to um, or unwilling to uh, attend at one point, you would still have the same obligations to convince them to attend at a future point. So don't ever lean away from this responsibility, lean in. It will make your job easier and better in the long run and it will improve outcomes for kids with disabilities. During this pandemic, or I would say, you know, we're mostly maybe hopefully on the other side of this pandemic, it has never been more important than now to communicate with parents. We've experienced these unprecedented times lack of communication builds mistrust. And particularly when you think back to, you know, March, April, 2020, when we're trying to figure out what in the heck are we going to do to continue to serve kids? And are we going to be able to do it face to face? And how do we meet the needs of kids with disabilities in a virtual environment? I mean, the questions just went on and on and on. Some of those decisions got made outside of the team framework. And nationwide, you can see a huge uptick in the amount of disputes. We've got class action lawsuits going on. We've got by state more and more complaints and due process hearing requests because decisions got made outside of the team context. Know that even during COVID, there is no opportunity to pass up team decision making. It's that important. Keep in mind, whether it's COVID or not, that lack of communication builds mistrust and mistrust breeds disagreement. Okay. So here are your don'ts for the day. Don't exclude parents from the decision-making process regarding their child, just don't do it. There's almost no support in the law for doing that. And the only time it's supported is when you can amass enough documentation to say that you were unable to convince the parents to participate. It's a really high hurdle. So just don't do it. Don't make unilateral changes to IEP services. We're gonna talk about that in more detail because your IEP must be implemented in the way it was written, or you have to go back and amend it or rewrite it. There's no opportunity for changes here on a unilateral basis. And then your third don't is don't underestimate the importance of prior written notice. It is your best friend when it comes to documenting that team decision-making, parent participation, all the things that were considered but maybe not selected as an option for a particular student and all of the reasons why. This is your best friend when it comes to documenting parent participation. So any questions about teamwork? And that's just, you know, obviously a really, really 30,000 foot overview. One thing I didn't mention, but I do want to mention is that when you make decisions in a team, there's also shared responsibility. That means no one person gets blamed right? If it doesn't have the particular outcome that the team intended, your job is to roll your sleeves up and get back in there and do some more planning and do some more digging and do some more assessments and figure out what's going on. But no one person can be blamed for that perceived failure if that decision is made as a team. Uh, in the long run, team decisions are more long lasting and they result in better outcomes for kids with disabilities because again, the collective wisdom of that team is far better than any one decision maker. So before we move off of that, any thoughts or comments? All right, aligning services to needs is our next category. FAPE is FAPE. That's true whether we're in the middle of a pandemic, that's true whether uh, you have a particularly contentious relationship with a parent, that's true whether you have a particularly challenging student, FAPE is still FAPE. And in the world of COVID, neither Congress nor the United States Department of Education have authorized a departure from any of the FAPE standards, okay? 
IEP teams must go through the same steps to propose an IEP based on the student's unique educational needs. That means you convene teams for the annual IEP. Um, you get the team talking anytime there is a lack of anticipated success. You uh, work in conjunction with the parent to get their agreement for IEP amendments. All of those same requirements still exist no matter what is happening in the world of pandemics or team composition, team relationships, it's all the same, FAPE is FAPE. And in April 27th of 2020, the then Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, submitted a report to Congress. She said the United States Department of Education is not requesting waiver authority for any of the core tenants of IDEA, most notably FAPE and the LRE. So that was a huge signal to all of us that this didn't represent, well, we'll try and provide it, but if we can't, or if the family doesn't have good internet access, or the student can't really tune into a computer, then we've tried and, and we can't be held accountable. That would be a mistake. That would be an error in thinking, because in the same way, during any other time in IDEA's history, when you... First of all, you must plan as a team. And second of all, when that IEP doesn't result in the anticipated benefit, you must go back and revise. Figure out what's going on and revise. The same is true here. When the pandemic hit, we got LRE all turned around in our heads. What does it look like when students are participating virtually? Um, I saw IEPs in Wyoming, in the great state of Wyoming, that somehow changed the placement to homebound because the student was participating in a virtual environment from home. That is, placement is the bundle of services delivered in the LRE. If, if home is the only place that the student can receive FAPE, then you, the team would make a homebound placement. But moving to a virtual learning opportunity, because that's what was happening nationwide, statewide, district-wide, or it was given as an option in order to maintain the health of students and their families, that is not necessarily a placement in order to receive FAPE. That is just another way of access, accessing the general curriculum. So we turned LRE over on its head. We need to have a clear understanding, getting that back squarely into the continuum that I'm going to show you in a few slides. Um, this is from August 24th of 2021, just recently. It's a letter to special education and early intervention partners by the Office of, Se of uh, Special Education Rehabilitative Services. We call it OSERS. OSERS made clear that for the 2021 school year, no IDEA requirements are waived. They went on to say that no matter what primary instructional delivery approach was chosen, SCAs and LEAs remain responsible for ensuring that FAPE is available to all children with disabilities. We couldn't have it more clear. FAPE is FAPE. So if you are serving students virtually, if you are serving uh, students in some kind of hybrid or combined environment, if you're offering them a choice, be clear that FAPE is still FAPE. Children with disabilities retain their rights to receive appropriate services under IDEA. And that means you have to have IEPs in effect on the first day of school with each school year. The students must be protected by IDEA. So when we think about FAPE, then we know it's the same FAPE that has always existed in this law um, or the earlier iterations of this law. Keep in mind that the team's focus in order to provide FAPE must be on educational benefits, right? Is the student benefiting from the services and supports that the IEP is providing designed by the IEP team? So the responsibility to propose FAPE rests with the school district. Even if you have teams that don't necessarily agree on what it should look like, there's an 
ultimate responsibility back on the school district to propose FAPE, which means an IEP reasonably calculated to provide educational benefit in light of the student's circumstance. Students, on the other hand, have the absolute right to receive FAPE. And that translates to educational benefit. If parents perceive that their child has been denied FAPE, they have the absolute right to challenge the school's decision-making and the school's proposal. In spite of this very onerous um, sort of competing and complementary at the same time responsibilities and rights, there's still no guarantee of success. So despite this reciprocal responsibility and right scenario, this framework set up under IDEA, it does not serve as a guarantee. Lack of educational benefit means the IEP team has more work to do, not that the IEP team has failed. If the IEP team fail, does not undertake that work, they will, have be con they will be considered to have failed the student, but only after they have um, essentially been non-responsive to that lack of benefit. Responding to lack of benefit going back into the team framework, trying to puzzle through why there's no benefit and puzzle through what changes are appropriate, courts will uphold FAPE in that scenario. When a school turns, and the courts will use this language, when a school or a school district turns a blind eye to a lack of benefit, that's when there's a denial of FAPE. So despite these responsibilities and rights, there's still no guarantee of success. What is guaranteed is the continued work of the team to come back and amend an IEP that is not resulting in educational benefit. And how do you do all of that? We're gonna go through it. First of all, keep in mind the overarching FAPE standards, okay? Appropriately ambitious in light of his unique circumstances. This comes from the Andrew F case. This case is very important to us. We have two United States Supreme Court cases that guide our work in special education. There are other cases, but these are the big ones. Um, these are the FAPE cases. We have the Raleigh case out of uh, the Supreme Court in 1982, and we have Andrew F in 2017. Andrew F did not overrule Raleigh. When, when it first came out, there was a large groundswell from the advocacy organizations and the attorney, the parents attorney bar that said, you can't cite rally anymore. It's over with, it's gone, it's dead law. Not so. And in fact, the United States Supreme Court went to great lengths to point out in the F Andrew F decision that rally remains the standard for most students. We now tag on in light of the students' unique circumstances for all kids um, with disabilities, el eligible students with IEPs. The difference is for students like those in Raleigh who participate in the general curriculum and in general classrooms, we have many, many measures of progress. We have report cards, we have curriculum based measures, we have uh, anecdotal information from teachers and providers, we have state and district wide assessments, we have screening, we have all MTSS data, we have all these measures for kids who are participating in the general curriculum and general classroom. For students like Andrew F, who are separate from the regular classroom and separate from the general curriculum based on their needs, we lost that connection. We lost that ability to gauge progress. And that's where Andrew F comes in and says that it must be appropriately ambitious in light of a student's unique circumstance. So whether the primary concern is behavior or, or um, impaired cognitive functioning to a significant degree, um, whatever it is for students who do not participate in the general curriculum or the general classroom environment, we still must expect progress. And that was the message in Andrew F. Here's the Hendrick, or Board of Ed of the Hendrick Hudson Central School District versus Raleigh. We call this the Raleigh case. And again, reasonably calculated for the child to receive educational benefit. This in my man, mind, for those of you that know me, I'm a visual learner, so it's very helpful for me to take all these complex, um, highly litigated concepts 
and put them in some sort of visual framework or frame of reference so that it's easier to follow along. And that's what you're looking at here. One of the crazy things that rumbles around in my mind and I put down on paper. Uh, first of all, if you are going to provide FAPE to a student, and this is true whether regardless of the student's disability and regardless of the services, uh, your profession, whether you're a speech language clinician, pathologist, whether you're a special ed teacher, whether you're an OTPT, every person in special education be, should be familiar with this FAPE continuum because it all starts with a comprehensive evaluation. You must get a clear, crystal clear understanding of the student's educational needs. So it all starts there. You do that through comprehensive evaluation of the whole child, not part of the child. And that is one note of caution that I'll interject for speech language pathologists. Sometimes I see a lot of files where the only assessment consideration is speech language. I will suggest to you, actually, I will encourage you quite strongly to avoid compliance problems in the future by looking at the whole child. I'm not saying you go test the whole child. I'm saying you look at the whole child and say what other areas, if any, represent questions for this team. And I'm gonna give you something, sort of a visual to go by for that. The comprehensive evaluation always, it always starts there. We have a system where we reevaluate, comprehensively reevaluate at least every three years or more often when requested by the parent or a teacher. That is for the purpose, when you combine comprehensive evaluation with all of the already existing data through curriculum-based measures, screeners, state and district-wide assessments, um, all of those things, you amalgamate all of that and you have this clear understanding of the pre present levels and educational needs of the student. You're going to refresh that every single year in the IEP. Get your fingers on the pulse of the student's now current educational needs. From there, you get to drafting measurable goals. And you should hear a clear link, a clicking sound between each one of these categories, because that's how important it is to link them together. And for measurable goals, you get to services and supports. Let my pointer catch up here. Again, we're looking at the whole child. You have to understand present levels. You translate those to educational needs. We get to drafting measurable goals. Remember these two words, rigorous, but reasonable. Rigorous meaning unique and targeted for this child. Reasonable meaning they could be attained within a year because these are annual IEPs we're drafting. Okay. There's one exception to this and that is if you have a student taking alternate assessments, working to alternate achievement standards, you would also be required to have shorter term objectives for those students. But you still have to have measurable goals. So this holds true for 100% of students for a small subset, there's an additional requirement. From there, you get to skill gaps, right? You're gonna identify what skill gaps a student has and the measurable goals are gonna target those skill gaps because it needs to be meaningful for this student and be based on their educational needs and all needs that result from the disability. From there, you're going to design services and supports to meet those needs, to close those skill gaps. You must implement services and supports consistently with the IEP. There's no opportunity for unilateral changes here. And you're gonna document that you've provided services and supports consistent with the IEP. All of that gets provided in the least restrictive environment. This is a mandate, this isn't an option. You must provide services to every student with a disability in the least restrictive environment. It is the only time you're going to read the word maximum in the regulations. Every place else is about what's appropriate based on a student's needs. When it comes to least restrictive environment, it is a maximizing standard, which is very different. And then, of course, educational benefit, which is a way of saying progress. This IEP that you are devising as a team must result in progress or educational benefit or the team has more work to do. Right? Again, denial of FAPE results when you turn a blind eye to lack of progress or you turn a blind eye to unexpected progress 
which means that you should be making the IEP more challenging. Right? So we're gonna go through each of these sections in some detail. It all starts with a comprehensive evaluation. It serves two purposes. One is identifying students who need specially designed instruction and related services because of an IDEA eligible disability. So again, prong one, IDEA eligible disability. And this comprehensive evaluation is also going to help teams identify the specially designed instruction and related services that the student requires. If the student does not need specially designed instruction, they cannot have related services and they are not IDEA eligible. This is true whether you like what I'm saying or not, right? You cannot cross special education's threshold with a student that doesn't have an IDEA disability and the need for specially designed instruction. Because you are speech language pathologists, you hold a special place under the IDEA in Wyoming because you are the only disability category that could serve as the specially designed instruction if a student is speech language only eligible. If a student is eligible in any other category, you automatically revert to a related service. It's not a demotion. It is a related service, which is designed to help the student to benefit from their specially designed instruction. It is the statutory scheme, and we don't have any option to flex on that until your legislature decides otherwise. Right? So speech language, you could be the primary disability, in which case you're providing specially designed instruction. If there is any other disability category, you are automatically a related service. Right? Speech would be a related service at that point. And I have offered you uh, both citations to statutes out of the regulations. And then this one is a page number to the commentary. So just a, a little bit of a digression here into a lesson on regulations. The IDEA is the statute. The federal regulations are drafted to implement the IDEA. So the federal regulations represent more substance. They put flesh on the bones of the IDEA and no state is free to offer less protection than what is available uh, in the federal regulations for students with disabilities. So when you see a long page number like this citation here, 71 Federal Register 46548, that is the 71st volume of the Federal Register on page 46548, right? So here's the regulations and here's the comments. There are far more comments to the regulations than regulations themselves. The reason for that is because the United States Department of Education is the agency that promulgates the federal regulations. And in that process, they put out for public comment all well, of their about proposed it. But regulations. I'm just glad Tracy said she's so, already. Yeah. Thank you for muting whoever that was. Um, and so when you have proposed regulations, the public gets to offer their comment, and then the agency that promulgates the rules responds to every single one of those comments that's in here. It's the first interpretive opportunity for the regulations, and it remains important. It still guides us today. Um, earlier, I told you it all starts with the comprehensive evaluation and that I was going to show you a graphic. This is that graphic. It doesn't matter if this is an articulation only suspicion or if this is a student who is fully and completely involved with multiple areas of difficulty. You're going to probe the whole child. The reason you're going to probe the whole child is to get a picture of the student's level of functioning across environments and to find out if you have any other areas of educational need and questions that need to be answered. So if we, for example, take um, an articulation only child, um, it's in many cases, and I continue to see this, 
um, they'll jump straight into the communication skills and the team will say, oh, this is Arctic only. We're going to do a Goldman Fristo and, and a, um, uh, a BDI and, you know, we will look only at articulation. The problem is, is that that student may have difficulties with functional skills. They may have difficulties with cognitive abilities. And I'll see this a lot, that their BDI score will come back with cognitive scores in the one to 2%, but they're RTIC only students when we're talking about young students. I also see this in uh, less in the older ages because by that time, the, the concerns in cognitive and functional areas have become so um, more pronounced. They become more obvious. As the curriculum gets more difficult, the gap widens for students who are unable to keep up without services. Um, so this same kind of evaluation wheel should be used regardless of the age, regardless of your suspicion, so that you make sure you look at the whole child. Very frequently, when we look at only a piece of this pie, what ends up happening is that three or four or six months later, the team is back into evaluation again because it's not having the uh, effect of providing the student with educational benefit. You still have unanswered questions about the student's educational needs. Your obligation is to conduct a comprehensive evaluation every time, not a piece of an evaluation, but a comprehensive evaluation. All right, so it looks like we have a comment. I see this too, and we as SLPs get a lot of pushback from psychologists about testing our kinder, kinders because they are too young. Well, I, I have seen this also. I know it exists. It is a reality. Part of this is a reality. The concern about testing young children is a reality, but there is no prohibition in the IDEA. And in fact, the, the uh, again, Part B goes from three to 22. And if a student has a disability, they have an absolute right to an IEP and FAPE. So somehow we have to be able to tease out, is this a student who may have a lack of exposure? But my, my challenge to all of you is if you use this evaluation wheel to look at the whole child, you will get a better understanding as to whether this is lack of exposure or lack of progress because you're gonna look at the whole student. You're gonna question, are they responding to small group instruction? Since school started you know, four months ago, have we seen an increase in skill? So you really want to make sure um, that it is a, a comprehensive view of the whole child. And Dana just put in there, she's reminded me that it's 21, but isn't it through 21 up to 22? If that last school year. Am I, do I have that right? I think it's through 21, but I could be wrong and I would love it if somebody, yeah, it is through 21. So that's when I say it's either through 21 or up to 22, but it's both saying the same thing there, but thank you for that clarification. Um, again, use this comprehensive evaluation wheel to tease that out. Do we have questions about the student's academic skills? Well, they're a little bit below expectations, but the growth made in the last three months tells us that this student is on a trajectory to close that skill gap without anything else. So maybe it is just a, a, a speech language, or maybe it is something else that we need to look at. So probe, probe, probe using this model, and you'll be able to tease that out. One of the best examples of this comes from my early professional career, and I was a school psychologist in a public school system for a number of years. And uh, I decided that I wanted to work with um, students who had more significant cognitive impairments. And so uh, I took a leap of faith and I shared my home with six cognitively impaired young adults who had grown up in the state hospital. They'd never lived anywhere but with me, starting as young adults. None of them had language. All were highly aggressive. They were missing eyes, lips, fingers, you know, appendages due to self-injury or injury to others. All six came to me in full headgear. It was the most physical job I'd ever had in my entire life. 
I thought as a school psychologist that I knew something about behavior and behavior planning. I knew nothing. I was just absolutely overwhelmed, but I stayed with it. One of the young people that came to me had a diagnosis and she was a headbanger, a severe headbanger. So she had uh, malformations of her head due to banging on hard surfaces the whole time she lived in the state hospital. You could very much see how that might impact one's hearing as well. And she had a diagnosis of being profoundly deaf, um, no language of any kind. Um, and she, for the most part, spent a great deal of her day tuning us out. However, after living with her 24 seven for a period of time, I began to realize that she was responding to things in her environment that she heard. She would hear people talking about going out to eat or you know, food, McDonald's, Burger King, and she'd show up with her jacket. Or, and this was in Minnesota, so you know, coats were almost always required. And, um, or she would show up, she had some old pick sims that she had never used, by the way, but she knew that those pick sims from McDonald's got her in the door at McDonald's. And so she would show up with her pick sims. This is clearly a person who's overhearing a conversation and responding to it, diagnosed as profoundly deaf. So had anyone ever looked at her and probed using a comprehensive evaluation wheel model we would have picked up much sooner. So is her lack of response the fact that she's not hearing? Is it her cognitive abilities are so low? And actually, once we found out that she could hear, then, you know, the next expectation was communication, definitely of a higher order. And then from there, we realized that she had some incredible skills that she was choosing not to use. She could match colors with 100% accuracy. She could count. She could do some things that nobody knew she could do because our expectations were fundamentally altered because we'd never question whether she could hear us. So this kind of probing question model is critical in real life. It's critical in special education. In order to cross special education's threshold through comprehensive evaluation, the team must demonstrate an IDEA disability and the need for specially designed instruction. Okay, there's no other, this is not about just needing a related service. If a student only needs a related service, and this is straight out of the regulations in 300.8, if a student only needs a related service, but not specially designed instruction, they're not an eligible student under IDEA. There's no gray area there. So if a student only needs counseling, or if a student only needs occupational therapy, they are not an eligible student under IDEA. The reason for that is because we have a system here that is funded and authorized to identify students with disabilities. And when we identify them with disabilities, then we have an obligation to provide FAPE for their needs. It is not simply a system of providing additional assistance for those that might need it. It is a system of identifying disability and responding to need. So the target here, you got some targets that you wanna meet as a member of the team. First of all, don't wait too long. I call it a mature child find obligation. Child find 300.111. If you've never read it, go read it. It's a two-pronged test as well. It is the suspicion of an IDEA disability and the suspicion of the need for specially designed instruction. Keep in mind that the regulations and the IDEA use the term suspicion. This is not an actual knowledge standard. That's the purpose of the comprehensive evaluation, right? Go evaluate the student and find out if your suspicion is correct. It is a suspicion standard, suspect an IDEA disability and the need for specially designed instruction. When that happens, it doesn't matter if the student is in a multi-tier system of support model, doesn't matter if they're already on a 504 plan, it doesn't matter. 
you have a mature child fine obligation under IDEA. That means that you must propose a comprehensive evaluation, seek the parent's consent, collect all of the data to answer all evaluative questions, whether or not commonly linked to a student's disability, and then propose FAPE. If you wait too long, it will be a denial of FAPE. So this case just came out out of the district court in Oregon, and I've got a few cases sprinkled in here just to emphasize a point now and again. The reason I, I brought this one in is because um, this is an evaluation of a kindergarten student. So in answer to a couple of the questions that have come up so far, this student was known to the school district and the Part C agency when they were uh, in the Part C program. They came up through little B, baby B, as a three-year-old. There were all sorts of questions about what is fate for the student, what is, and when a student changes from Part C to Part B, there must be a comprehensive evaluation. That's an initial evaluation. You're entering Part B for the first time. This group decided, the school district said that they were going to postpone the evaluation until the child entered kindergarten because they didn't want to inappropriately identify a young student. They didn't want, they were suspecting autism, by the way. They didn't want to inappropriately identify too early a student with autism. This child did not do well, right? So under the law, this court goes on to say, a district must evaluate a child it suspects has a disability that necessitates specialized services. This school district had longstanding concerns regarding sensory processing and communication and had served the student in part C, but they did not take on their responsibility for a comprehensive evaluation in part B until the student got to kindergarten. So what ended up happening here, and I flipped too soon, sorry. This court, and I, I facilitate a, a quarterly work group for hearing officers. I had the hearing officer, the week this decision came out, I had the hearing officer that decided the case under this one um, at the due process hearing level with me on the line for two hours. And he got the opportunity to explain his award of service for this student and why he awarded the student so much. This five-year-old received an award of 500, excuse me, this five-year-old received an award of 900 hours of compensatory services. That is a lot. It's an entire year's worth of education for a five-year-old. And by the way, that's in addition to the school day, not in place of it. But this hearing officer felt so strong that the school district had violated the student's rights in such an egregious way because he needed to be evaluated and they didn't do it. So my message to you is don't wait too long. It is not helpful. This is true whether it's a young person or an older person. We see waiting too long be a denial of faith on the uh, other end for students in high school particularly when mental health concerns surface. And, uh, and districts are reluctant to, and historically haven't been expected to be involved in mental health concerns. But when those mental health concerns adversely affect a student's educational performance, even at the high school level, it is time you have a mature child fine obligation and you must propose an evaluation, seek the parent's consent and move forward. So we have this at all ends of the spectrum, age spectrum. I don't mean to suggest this is only uh, an a, a early intervention problem. It's not. It is throughout the spectrum of ages. The message remains the same. Do not wait too long. If a student is in um, uh, tiered interventions, we see this as well. Sometimes um, we call that RTI. Other times we call it PBIS. Other times we call it MTSS. It doesn't matter the acronym. If a student is in a tiered intervention model and for whatever reason, whether it's lack of progress, whether it's a parent that brings you outside information um, and you have a reason to suspect an IDEA disability and the need for specially designed instruction, you must move forward. You cannot wait until you get your 12 data points or the 12 weeks in interventions. You just can't do it. 
you will be held to violate the child's right to faith. Okay. So I think we have another question. I'm going to pause for that. When the CDC does not have the capacity to conduct such an evaluation and WD is the body of oversight, is there an obligation of the school district to help in this evaluation process when cognitive or AS, ASD is the concern? Um, let me answer that by saying that it remains the CDC's obligation, and I would say the BHD, because the BHD, the Behavioral Health Division of the Department of Health, is the LEA. They contract out with different centers, and those centers are the CDCs, right? Child Development Centers. So it's the BHD's responsibility through the CDC to conduct a comprehensive evaluation, even if they don't have a particular area of expertise, they must go get it. They must seek it out at no cost to the parent. If they can work collaboratively with a local school district, thumbs up on that. You know, all the better for students and all the better for getting to know a student who may be coming your way anyhow in a year or two. But, you know, yes, the school district may be called upon to help, but it's not because WDE is asking, it's because the BHD through the CDC is the one that has the obligation to conduct a comprehensive evaluation, whether or not they have in-house expertise. And at times when they need to seek the out-of-house expertise, they may come to the local district. All right, another question, what happens when a child enters Part C just prior to their third birthday? Um, for example, a child enters Part C, then one to two months later, turns three, Yes, another comprehensive evaluation must be completed, all right? But keep in mind, under the IDEA, what, I'm gonna ask it as a question, and, and for the first person to answer it, Dina might be communicating with you afterwards. The first person to answer the question, this question, what does every single comprehensive evaluation begin with? Shout it out or put it in chat right now. All right, the first person to say this is Tammy Fawcett. Did I say your name right? And it's review of already existing data. A couple other people got it, but it is the review of already existing data. So Tammy, you are the winner today. Thank you for that response. You do not need to go complete the same evaluative tool that was just completed one to two months prior, but you must review it as a part B team, all right? And then you must go through the comprehensive evaluation wheel and say, are there any other areas with unanswered questions? If so, now you must propose to gather that evaluative data. But every single evaluation starts with a review of already existing data. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy and the others that said that. All right, so did I miss any questions? I think I had one more pop in that I passed by. If there's no access to such a resource to a CDC, how does the BHD help the CDC? I am going to defer that question to the BHD um, because that is their first level of oversight. CDCs, you know, the BHD holds the contract with the CDCs. So I would defer that to them and, and, um, and also encourage you all to develop collaborative relationships with the districts within your geographical area. Um, comprehensive does not mean a formal test, does it? No, I just said that. What it means is that you comprehensively probe the child, the whole child in every area. And from that probing question model, you determine what, if any, unanswered evaluative questions exist? Now you go propose an evaluation to get the answers to those questions, all right? You propose assessments, but the whole process is a comprehensive evaluation, beginning with the review of existing data and probing the whole child to determine what, if any, additional assessments must be conducted. So it's the whole process. Comprehensive does not necessarily mean test, 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 test. Comprehensive means whole child, all areas of need. We good on that? 
Okay, so any other thoughts or questions? I have one more case here, I believe, to give you as an example. This is out of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is in Texas. This district delayed an evaluation of an elementary school student who struggled in reading comp and failed to develop an adequate IEP. What happened here is that this student had a 504 plan. The 504 plan was not successful. It was not resulting in progress. And it was a signal that the child may need specially designed instruction. So this district waited for several months after the district knew the child's reading comprehension wasn't improving. Child find violation, denial of fake, right? You are not free to wait months. You must be responsive to a struggling student. Again, does it mean that you automatically test in every single area? No, go back and look at the whole child and find out what's going on. It could be that there's a health concern that is interfering with their learning. Could be a mental health concern that's interfering with their learning. Any number of things but you must probe the whole child to find out. If a student has a 504 plan and they're unsuccessful on it, your child find alarm should be going off. You may very well have a mature child find obligation. Okay, so I've said this ad nauseum, I'm gonna say it one more time, evaluate the whole child. As a team, do we have any unanswered questions about the student's ability or performance across all environments? What data must be collected in order to answer these questions? Again, it may not require new data if you have already existing data that can answer those questions. Okay. Lots of BHD questions today. The next one here is the BHD subcontracts with regional programs to provide services. By accepting that contract, the regions are assuring the BHD that they're able to complete, comply with all parts of the IDEA, including the provision, or in, including, I believe it's providing comprehensive evaluations. If regions do not have access to specific evaluation, it is their duty to find it. Yes, Kim, thank you. That's stated very succinctly. Again, the BHT contracts. Now, if a CDC is really stymied about how to access additional expertise, you know, the BHD is also a resource and, and could provide additional information and some guidance like Kim is doing in this, in this comment right here. But it, the ultimate responsibility rest with the CDC because they did accept the contract. Kim's absolutely right. Okay. Here's one more case out of the District Court of Minnesota. This one was about regardless of what classification under IDEA, the district must ensure that it identifies and addresses all of the students' disability-related needs. So that means you have to look at the whole student, right? All disability related needs. The district must evaluate the student in all suspected areas of disability, develop appropriate goals, revise the IEP as needed to address lack of progress. Anytime you don't do that, and it's not a one and done here because you may devise an IEP that you think is gonna be a home run and it doesn't result in the anticipated progress. You've got to go back in and say, what's going on? Why is this child not making the progress that we thought he or she would make? And you may need to revise the IEP, or you may need to go as far back as comprehensive evaluation, but you absolutely must look at the whole child. In this case, the district was ordered to reimburse the parents for students' private reading program and the cost of independent educational evaluations. These denial of faith cases are very expensive for school districts as well. So you wanna make sure, and I, when I say expensive, there are two costs. The human costs of a student maybe missing a year of their education and experiencing abject failure and the financial costs. Because to get through a due process hearing, to get through federal court litigation, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, I surprised myself. One more case, this is out of Maryland. The district denied FAPE to an elementary school student with autism. 
by not only failing to conduct an FBA in a timely manner, but also developing an IEP that failed to address the interfering behaviors. I'm so glad I, I um, included this case because we sort of have academics dialed in, right? I mean, we clearly know what to do when a student is experiencing academic failure or struggles. We have a really good playbook. We have multi-tiered system of supports. We have um, all sorts of other supports and we kind of have dialed in that mature child find obligation. But when a student gets good grades, but it's the behavior that's interfering with their learning, maybe they can't stay in class, maybe they um, are being suspended or expelled from school, they're being removed. Um, you have got to pay attention to that behavior. It could be the area of need that is interfering with the, the uh, educational needs of the student, adversely affecting those educational needs. So the message in this case is figure out what to do about a student's behavior. There is no requirement for an FBA early on in the process. And in fact, it's tied into the discipline provisions of all places. But don't get caught up in that. Know that you have this overarching responsibility to keep your fingers on the educational needs of the student. Educational, not just academic. And if you look closely, a careful read of the regulations will mean educational is more than just academics. It also includes functional and behavioral. So. Don't get tied up in, we don't have an academic need. If you have an educational need, you must pay attention to it. And in this case, they waited six months. Denial of faith. Six months is too long. Okay. Once you have a crystal clear understanding of current educational needs, you're going to get to present levels, right? Present levels are artfully drafted every single year in the annual IP, they're updated. If your present levels of academic achievement and functional performance are remaining the same, that is going to be a red flag to any due process hearing officer or court. Because there's no way that you can tell me that a student's present levels of academic achievement and functional performance are identical in grades one as grade two as grade three. If it is, you got a fake problem because you're not providing an IEP that has resulted in educational benefit. You don't want to shoot your team in the foot, the proverbial foot that way. Make sure you have crystal clear present levels of education, academic achievement and functional performance, educational need. And when we talk about this, it is, it is really answering the question, what skill does the student currently have across environments, behavioral skill, social skill, academic skill, what skills does the student currently have? Across environments means throughout the school day, structured times, unstructured times, lunch, recess, um, even the home or community, if that's interfering with their education. Um, and by that, I mean, if the student has mental health needs and they, for instance, uh, develop anxiety disorder and they won't leave their own bedroom, you got a problem that adversely affects education, right? And how does this student's disability affect his or her involvement in the general curriculum? I am going to tell you, if there's one takeaway today, one, it's to tie FAPE to the general curriculum, right? Special education is not a parallel universe. Back in the day when I was a school psychologist, it was a parallel universe. And guess what? Kids didn't do well. We ended up with this huge achievement gap between regular education students and students with disabilities in all areas. We have got to work hard to bring that achievement gap back into parity and look at tying special education to the general curriculum. I was doing some work in the state of Florida over the past couple of months, continuing ongoing work. And um, one of their schools said, but wait a minute, the IDEA doesn't require us to make sure that they make progress in the general curriculum. The IDEA requires us to provide special ed. Oh, contraire. There are multiple places in the IDEA that tie specially designed instruction to the general education curriculum. So if you take nothing else away today, go back and look at your work as a special educator in relation to the general curriculum. And by the way, 
who is the expert at the IEP team table in the general curriculum? Anyone? It is the regular education teacher. They have an incredibly important role to play in linking the specially designed instruction to the general curriculum. They are the general curriculum experts. That's what they teach. We need them at the table. We need to elevate their importance at the table. They're not just somebody filling a chair. They are incredibly important in this process. So visually here, think about the present levels of academic achievement and functional performance. I have a personal mission, by the way, to not say that acronym because it makes no sense to me. And I am against acronyms that don't make sense. So in my world, I call it present levels. Present levels are compared to the general curriculum. Make no mistake about it. It says it right in black and white in the regulations. From present levels, we get to this is what we expect in the general curriculum. This is the, current, the student's current skill level. And it's this gap right here, this skill gap that we're going to target, right? This skill gap is compared to standards. What do we expect third graders to do? What do we expect fourth graders to do? And what is this student doing? And from there, we know where to target our measurable goals because we've very carefully and comprehensively identified skill gaps. This is unique for every student. Okay? That's why if you are in a system that routinely provides 30 minutes of service or 20 minutes of service or 50 minutes of service, you have a red flag there because every single student's goals should require a unique look at how much time to support those goals. This is not a recipe. Okay. Goals must be clearly linked to skill gaps. This means that they're based on the unique needs of a student and they're designed to help the student be successful in the general curriculum. Again, go back and read the regulation. There we see general curriculum again. It was in the present level section. Now it's in the measurable goals section. And then my words that I want you to remember, rigorous but reasonable, right? Any questions before we move on to aligning, providing services to those needs that we've identified? Anyone? All right, here we go. You must provide services consistent with the IEP. FAPE is aligned with the general curriculum. We know that this is not universally true. It's mostly true, right? There are one to two percent of students who may be working in alternate standards. aligned to an alternate curriculum. Those are the only students that are not directly linked to the general curriculum or a downward extension of the general curriculum depending on the student's needs. But again, another link, 300.39. This is the definition of special education. It's a long definition. I've included a few points here. It's specially designed instruction adapting as appropriate to the needs of an eligible child, the content, methodology, or delivery of instruction, and the two bullet points that are next are what's important, to address the unique needs of a child that result from the disability, and to ensure access to the child to the general curriculum so that the child can meet educational standards that apply to all children. This is true whether they're in preschool or high school. Wyoming has educational standards that students are expected to meet. So your IEP, has to be this very unique combination of identifying the student's educational needs, their present levels of performance across environments, and those skill gaps so that you can help the child be successful in the general curriculum, right? There are more points of alignment in the regulations, okay? Again, this is involvement and progress in the general curriculum. This is the present levels. Uh, description of the special ed and related services to enable the child to be involved in and make progress. This is the contents of the IEP. 
And a comment on page 46579, the clear implication is that there's an education curriculum that is applicable to all children and that this curriculum is based on the state's academic content standards. That's the general curriculum we're talking about. The same general curriculum as for all students. Okay. That was special education. Now we get to related services. Related services may be an important component of FAPE for some students. Not all students need related services, but when they do, they are absolutely entitled to them, right? And by definition, and we have this turned over in many IEPs and certainly at many IEP team table discussions. By definition, related services are required to help a student to benefit from their specially designed instruction. Okay, this is not the golden corral method of service selection where you just keep on layering more and more services, related services, because they might help. Because a lot of times we provide related services on a pullout basis. Every time we pull a child out of the general curriculum, we've created a hole that we're going to test them on, by the way, because these students participate in state and district wide assessments, whether or not they have received the instruction. Seems inherently unfair to me. And it's one of the reasons that I would encourage a whole fresh look at service delivery models across the country. We only pull kids out when absolutely needed because they have a right to participate and make progress in the general curriculum. Okay. So if you think about this interplay between the general curriculum, special ed and related services, it looks something like this. The circle at the middle represents the general curriculum, same curriculum for all kids. And then you wrap around the special education or the specially designed instruction as it's defined in order for the student to participate in and make progress in the general curriculum. So special ed supports the general curriculum. And then you wrap around related services. Related services by definition are so that a student can benefit from their specially designed instruction. It's one of the reasons that if a student needs only a related service and doesn't need that blue circle of specially designed instruction, they cannot get that through special education. You cannot use special ed funding for that. You cannot identify that student as a student with a disability if they only need a related service. And then down at the bottom, we have supplementary aids and services are provided to enable children with disabilities to be educated with non-disabled children to the maximum extent appropriate. So supplementary aids and services like is throwing a blanket over all of this. We're gonna support the student throughout all settings so that they can maximize their time with non-disabled peers. As a speech language clinician or pathologist, if speech language service is provided as the special education, how does the service help the student make progress in the general curriculum? You have got to have that link or you're not providing specially designed instruction, right? I very often, particularly, and somebody mentioned the Arctic only kids earlier in the chat box, sometimes I see, you know, in, increasing the number of sounds that the student makes across environments, but there's no link to how they were deficit in the general curriculum in the first place, or how increasing those sounds is going to help them make progress in the general curriculum. I'm not saying it, that link doesn't exist. I'm saying I don't always see it articulated, but that is the job of the team. If you are providing specially designed instruction or special education, you must link that to the student's progress in the general curriculum. If speech language service is provided as a related service, your question changes a little bit and it becomes this, how does the service help the student to benefit from his or her specially designed instruction, right? Those are the only two ways that you provide service, especially for speech language. Very, very rarely would I see that as a supplemental aid or service. So for speech language purposes, we're talking about as, a, as the special education, specially designed instruction linked to the general curriculum or as a related service linked to benefiting the specially designed instruction. 
Next in your path, the work of the team, you must design and provide services to help students meet IEP goals. Keep in mind, once determined by the team, services must be provided in accordance with the IEP. There's no freestyling. And by freestyling, I mean changing the IEP at all. Sometimes freestyling occurs out of the kindness of one's heart where a student might be you know, struggling and needing some extra time in the resource room. That is not possible unless you amend the IEP um, to you know, pull a student out for some additional counseling is not possible unless you have that flexibility incorporated into the IEP, maybe through a behavior intervention plan or you amend the IEP. Services must be delivered consistent with the IEP. So the number amount of service, sometimes it's number of minutes, sometimes it's number of hours, doesn't matter. You must, as a team, provide services consistent with the IEP. If there is a small, tiny variation for a short period of time, that may be a procedural violation only. If it's a material change, a material discrepancy from how the IEP is written to how the services are implemented, that will be a denial of FAPE. It's a violation either way, either procedural or substantive, because services must be provided consistent with the IEP. No one on the team, whether it's a well-meaning special ed teacher, speech language pathologist, counselor, no one on the IEP team has the capacity or the authority to freestyle. All right. Oh, I went too fast. Least restrictive environment is what we're up to next. This is an absolute mandate. It's required. Um, you must make sure that students are educated with non-disabled children to the maximum extent appropriate, and you only get to special classes or pull out services. If regular classes with supplementary aids and services cannot be satisfactorily achieved, and only if no lesser restrictive option would work, could you get to separate schools? Only if no lesser restrictive option would work, do you get to residential settings? And let me go back, only if education with no peers is the only option, would you get to homebound? Virtual instruction is not homebound. Virtual instruction is participating in the general curriculum virtually, probably with other kids. And if it's a hybrid model, some could be in person and some could be virtual. It is not a placement for the purposes of COVID. Okay. Couple cases here. I'm going to leave you to read those because I'm afraid that we'll run out of time here. Um, but just know I've given you examples of um, when schools have been found in violation for these premises that we're talking about. This was a three-year-old with autism and the parent had to experience tuition costs and trans transportation costs to um, access a general education preschool. The court ruled against the school district. The child has a right to a least restrictive environment and only if they can't be successful there do you get to place them with students with disabilities or students or settings where you have more students with disabilities? Otherwise, they get the general education environment with supports imported there, right? Could be supplementary aids and services. It could be specially designed instruction. It could be related services. Only if a student can't be successful, do we go to a more restrictive setting. All right, I wanna move on to this concept of educational benefits. What is a reasonable amount of progress? Remember our goals. Rigorous, but reasonable, right? Rigorous meaning targeted, challenging, unique. Reasonable meaning growth over time, and it must be demonstrable. First, a note about progress. You are reporting progress in quantitative data and qualitative description, both. Your IEP forms have a the model IEP forms from the state have both on there. If you're not using the model IEP forms, you still need to describe it the same way. I very often see descriptions, but no data. Or sometimes I'll see data, but no description. This is both, right? You want to be 
very articulate in describing progress. Again, you're gonna look at the whole child in all areas of need. What is a reasonable amount? Well, anyone have a guess? Because the team has already determined what is a reasonable amount. Where is that? Any ideas? Where would you find what is a reasonable amount of progress for the student? It's in the measurable annual goal. The team who knows this child best, that's right, it's in your goal. The team that knows this child best, who has comprehensively evaluated the student, who has articulately described their present levels of academic achievement and functional performance across environments, has identified skill gaps, and then designed measurable annual goals to help close those skill gaps. By designing measurable annual goals, they have decided what is a reasonable amount of progress to expect within one year. So when you're trying to decide, is this a reasonable amount of progress, you had better go back and look at the IEP. It's one of the reasons that data and qualitative description become so important. Because if you have a student who has flatlined, time is important to understand. The context of time is critical. Has it been that way for weeks, months? Is it time to amend the IEP? Or did they flatline in the beginning and all of this progress was recent? In which case, you might be on track. But that description is critical to understanding what is a reasonable amount of progress. So keep in mind, rigorous, challenging, targeted, unique, reasonable. How much of the skill gap can we expect to close? And go back to your IEP for that because there's an annual goal in there that will give you guidance. Couple cases about this. This is a New Mexico school district elementary student with a learning disability. Um, the school district failed to develop adequate IEPs and failed to ensure the student received appropriate instruction in reading and writing, All right? No progress for the student. She was not progressing as anticipated and the team didn't go back and try and figure out what was going on. So the district continues the student's current level of services despite her lack of progress. And that's a denial of fate. When the team bumps into a lack of progress, they must go back and look at through the entire FAPE continuum. Is it because we no longer have a clear understanding of her comprehensive need, educational needs? Do we need to go back to comprehensive evaluation? Do we need to go back and, and re-describe the student's present levels of academic achievement and functional performance? Are the goals wrong? Were the services not provided? There will be a broken link in that FAPE continuum. You've got to go back and find it. In this case, the school did not go back and find it. And even after the student repeatedly failed to meet her reading and writing goals, they offered the substantially the same program. They changed a little bit for three years. One of the things that they did is reduce the expectations instead of finding out why the student wasn't progressing. Just by you know, dumbing it down, that is not gonna save you from a fake claim. You've got to go back and say, what about this is not meeting the student's needs? You can't just simply say, we'll expect less and it'll look better in the long run. Okay, um, yeah, same, this is the same student, same case, third, fourth and fifth grade IEPs were substantially similar, right? That is a FIPE violation. So how, Keep in mind, before we leave this area, the educational benefit is behavioral progress too, if you have a student with behavioral needs. So you would need to be able to have a way of quantifying what is a reasonable amount of progress for a student with a behavioral IEP as well, right? You go back to the goals. You go back to, if it's a behavior intervention plan, quantify and describe how the student is doing on the behavior intervention plan. But make sure that you clearly articulate educational benefit. If you don't, go back and problem solve through it. So how do you know if it's working? Progress monitoring. This is true 
whether it's a speech language standalone goal, whether it's a speech language goal to assist the student's writing goal, doesn't matter how it's woven into the IEP, you must monitor progress. Collect data. And in the world of COVID, my recommendation is to collect and share data at a higher frequency so that everybody can build their confidence back up that these services are working. Okay. Monitor progress towards IEP goals and progress in the general curriculum, both. Because when you have data that supports the student is closing the gap and making progress towards their IEP goals and also making progress in the general curriculum, you are rock solid, right? You've got a team that's working well together. I'm, I would also um, be very surprised if you didn't have a parent that was particularly pleased with the amount of progress and very trusting of the team at this point when you can document progress towards IEP goals and progress in the general curriculum. They're both critical. You need to stay vigilant here communicate often with parents. If for some reason there's a dip and you experience a lack of progress, lean in, get that parent involved, start problem solving, go back and find the broken link. You know, the lack of progress may be something like the genesis of that maybe information only the parent could provide. Maybe the student had a death in the family and has been taking it quite hard and has tuned out from learning. How would you know that if you didn't involve the parent and start working together as a team? So you got to lean in when you have lack of progress. What happens if a student makes little or no progress? You must, you must engage in the four R's. This is what I call the four R's. Who does this? It's the team, not a single person on the team but the team that includes the parents. When in a reasonable amount of time, if you are waiting months to address lack of progress, you will be vulnerable to a denial of fate claim, whether that comes in the form of a state complaint, whether that comes in the form of a due process hearing. If you wait months, there will be a denial of fate in the event of a challenge, unless you've gone back and engaged in these four R's. Because if the IEP is not recalibrated, a, done, a denial of faith will result. So how do you do this? The four R's, reconvene, review, re-strategize, and revise. There must be documentation of this within the student's file, okay? So let's go through these. When I say reconvene, I don't necessarily mean eyeball to eyeball at the same table. I mean, get that team talking. Could be a telephonic meeting with a parent. It could be a meeting among school staff and uh, a person then communicating with the parent. It could be a full IEP team meeting with all mandatory membership present. The bottom, it could be a virtual meeting, a Zoom meeting, a team meeting, doesn't matter. Reconvene that team to get everyone talking. Doesn't have to be in the same place at the same time, but get everyone talking about what's going on with the student because we are experiencing a lack of educational benefit, right? From that point, you wanna review. Go back and think about that fake continuum. Review meaning, do we have unanswered questions regarding comprehensive evaluation? Do we have a clear understanding of the student's educational needs? Have we identified skill gaps? Have we provided services according to the measurable goals in order to support the student achieve their measurable goals? You go through that whole process and say, okay, this is what we need to change after our very thorough review. And then you re-strategize. If we change this, what will happen? If we change this, if we add this, if we take this away, what will happen? And then you set out to revise the IEP, right? What about unexpected progress, meaning that the student made more gains than was anticipated in their annual IEP? They closed the gap faster than the team thought they would. What do you do? The same thing, the four R's. If you stay, stag, if you just sit on that unexpected progress and you don't continue to close the gap, 
that will be a FAPE violation too. You must always have an IEP in place that addresses the now current educational needs and is an opportunity for the student to make progress in the general curriculum and receive educational benefit. So if you have unexpected progress, by the way, this is straight out of the regulations. If you have unexpected progress, the team must go back and engage in the four hours, a reasonable amount of time, not months. Because if the IEP is not recalculated, a denial of FAPE will result. So anytime educational needs change, it's time to realign the IEP to address new educational needs in order to provide access to and the opportunity to progress in the general curriculum, right? Reconvene, review, re-strategize, and revise. Get the IEP team together virtually, telephonically, at the same table, it doesn't, you've got to do it. If this is the time for your annual IEP, it must be in a meeting with all mandatory team membership. Anytime after the annual IEP, you can amend by agreement with the parent afterwards, okay? Ask what additional information is needed to fully understand the current student's current educational needs. Develop a plan to get that information and then set a time to review. Go back and find the broken link between these areas. There will be one. And then you review all information collected. You ask tons of questions. This is a time to probe, probe, probe. Look at the whole child. Get a clear understanding of the student's current functioning. Have the present levels changed? Were the goals rigorous but reasonable? Were services provided consistent with the IEP? You would want to answer all of these questions plus some in your review of the student. Then you re-strategize. What services and supports does the student need to meet the goals? Once you have a clear understanding of how to re-strategize, then you go back and revise the IEP. Keep in mind that you must also re-strategize the least restrictive environment at times. Ask what is the least restrictive environment where the student can be successful and have a clear understanding as a team between the difference of the difference between placement and location. Again, placement is the bundle of services delivered in the least restrictive environment. And location is something like the student's living room where they're turning on their computer to participate in virtual instruction. All right, they're not the same. When you have a clear understanding of how to re-strategize, you go back and revise. Revise the IEP to meet the student's now current educational needs. Could be a new annual IEP if you're at that time, or it could be an amendment. Now you go provide services and supports in conformity with that new IEP or the amended IEP. You go collect and report frequent progress data. And again, if you don't get what you anticipated as a team, go back to the four R's over and over again, making sure that you keep careful documentation of that. You build trust when you do this process. Again, the IEP is not a guarantee of success, but you build trust. You have a healthy team. You reduce the number of disputes and disagreements by going through this process of engaging in the four R's. Because we work on behalf of students with disabilities, these steps are important. Just a, a couple parting um, cases that I wanna share with you and then we're gonna open it up to questions. Um, this is a case out of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, student with autism and speech language impairment. Um, the student's lack of progress and failing to conduct timely uh, needed evaluations meant a denial of FAPE. This is also a case about a student repeating goals from one IEP to another, that's a red flag. So as a team, one of the things that you can clearly test in short order, go back tomorrow, take a look at your IEPs, if they're repeating goals from year to year to year, red flag. You need to go back into the four R's and find out if this team has a clear understanding of the student's educational needs. For each goal that was repeated, the team should consider whether student requires additional or different services to improve. This is a court saying it, not me. This is a court saying this. For each goal that is repeated, the IEP team should consider 
whether the student requires additional or different services to improve. Otherwise, the court may find the IEP wasn't designed to enable the child to make progress. So you wanna make sure that you're dealing with stagnant progress in a way that is demonstrated in the file. This is out of the Central District of California. So this is about a student with behavioral needs and it's sometimes really difficult to develop an appropriate educational program for a student with intensive behavioral deficits and needs. Give yourself the opportunity to come back to the team and really take a look at progress for a student with significant behavioral challenges. Because very likely you're not going to hit on the right combination or the perfect behavior intervention plan the first time. More often than not, when it comes to behavior, because there's so many reasons for inappropriate behavior um, that you have to go back and study that child again and again. And sometimes, in, as in this case, the student had uh, 314 minutes per day of group instruction in his IEP in the general education setting. Unfortunately, this is a student that became so overstimulated in that environment that he couldn't benefit from the full 314 minutes. The team had an obligation to go back and look at that behavior again and say, what supplementary aids or services could we provide to support the student? Or is his least restrictive environment elsewhere for this portion of his day so that he can be successful? But the bottom line is even for behavior and particularly that challenging behavior, I get a lot of calls and questions about challenging behavior because a lot of times it's dealt with by removal rather than the four R's. And that is a critical error. That's a FAPE error if it's challenged. I leave you with this visual one more time because you have got to puzzle backwards even for a student with behavioral challenges. Where is the broken link? It will be there. Right? This is the team's responsibility. And then this last one I want to leave you with is a case that's about bullying. And, um, and I, I bring it to you. Um, it's, a, it's a very tragic case. And this is a young man, very young man who had Asperger's syndrome and a couple other disabilities. Um, he was the subject of peer bullying to the extent where he was terribly injured at the hands of peers. And the school did not intervene. And know that a denial of FAPE can result from the school's failure to intervene in bullying as well. This case just is so egregious. This young man was being um, pummeled on the ground, kicked and hit by the same group of young men over and over again and they would target his genitals, kicking him. Uh, he let his parents know, and the parent notified the school district immediately. The school district was on notice that this was occurring. The school district attempted to use some restorative justice techniques by bringing the bully and the victim together to say, be friends, be friends. That very next day, the bully then used that against the victim to say, you can't tell on your friends and he beat them and pummeled them again. The end result is this will cost the district millions of dollars because not only is this a denial of faith case, it is a 14th Amendment substantive due process case now that is winding its way through the court system. By the way, the student had to have surgery, one testicle had to be removed, and they were not sure that the second testicle would be vi viable and survive. So this is a student with lifelong injuries as a result of bullying that took place at school repeatedly. Don't let this be the denial of fate that derails your team. And by the way, this parent will never trust the school again. So my message here in ending with this case as egregious as it is, is to make sure that you intervene early. Don't wait too long regardless of the reasons for the denial of FAPE, whether it's not understanding the student's educational needs, not having a clear picture of those needs, not having measurable goals that are targeted to close those skill gaps, not providing services consistent with the IEP, do not wait. Go back into the four R's when you have a lack of educational benefit 
or unexpected progress. So I think we've got five, four minutes left. I would open it up to questions for the time remaining. Anyone? Um, let me see here. We did have a question beforehand too about um, minutes of service and the similarities like a student getting um, 30 minutes no matter what their the magnitude of their need the student gets 30 minutes no matter the magnitude of their lead whatever need that is that kind of system will be suspect if it's challenged because again this notion of what a student needs in order to receive educational benefit is going to be different for student a versus student b versus student c um, that has to be uniquely designed in each student's IEP, and it cannot be based on staff availability, scheduling, or administrative convenience. Right. Any other questions? Okay, thanks for using the chat and asking those questions. And Dina, don't forget you have somebody that answered a question for me spontaneously, and I want to make sure that they're reinforced for that. Um, and also, if you could please save the chat for me. I definitely did. And I just want to point out that we do have some things in the chat. We'll stay on oh. here a little bit for you to be able to capture those. Um, this recording will be available at the Wyoming Instructional Network, and that is in the chat, along with PTSB information and evaluation information with that link. So please make sure you go back and grab that. Um, if you did not receive the materials earlier in the chat, um, that will also be available for you um, at the Wyoming Instructional Network, and those are already uploaded. So, um, Lenore, once again, you have provided us with a wealth of information, and we are so appreciative of your time and expertise, and really appreciative of all of you who've been here today to participate and who have asked questions and who have made comments. It really is helpful as we go along. So I really appreciate you being here today. And um, if there's no further questions, um, I just wanna say thank you again, Lenore, it was amazing.